the Arnie Ball Show. This is mm -hmm. Jim Orr with me today, Coach Ball. I'd like to uh, start off, Coach, with uh, a discussion, if we could, of uh, the success of the team as far as its relationship with the, the West Coast teams. I was uh, looking over the information out of the Sports Information Department today, and it uh, told us that uh, we are the most successful team east of Sepulveda Boulevard against the the, the West Coast teams. Uh, we've got an 8-2 and two record against them. Why the success against the West Coast this year that we haven't been able to enjoy in the past, and I don't think anybody really has enjoyed that kind of success, maybe outside of the Penn State team what, four or five years ago? Well, Jim, that's, that's an interesting statistic uh, that means absolutely nothing <laughs> in regards to um, you know what some of our goals are. Uh, I suppose part of the reason for that would be that some of the West Coast teams are down as compared to what they have been in the past. I think that our program, of course, has elevated itself a little bit, and we've been fortunate enough to beat uh, you know, USC a couple times, and unfortunately have lost to Santa Barbara a couple times. But uh, I just think that uh, the level of play out West right now is uh, really concentrated in about four or five schools, uh, maybe five or six, where in the past it had been, it's been concentrated in 10 or 11. Uh, and we've played some of those schools that are struggling a little bit and been fortunate enough to beat them. And with the rise in the level of our program and with the kind of kids we have right now, we're able to, to beat those, those teams. The um, offense that IPFW has enjoyed as far as its success this year is concerned, uh, we were talking the other day, we've got eight players with 100 plus kills. Um, on our team. Obviously, very few of those players then are going to be national leaders as far as statistics are concerned. Can you put that in, in layman's perspective? What would it be the equivalent of uh, 100 kills by eight different players on this team? What would it what would it be like if we were talking baseball terms? I don't know about baseball. It's real easy for me to relate that to basketball coming from the Hoosier State. And okay. We're in the middle of Mad March Madness and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it really relates to a basketball team having five players, maybe four, but uh, more than likely five, averaging double figures. You know, uh, just so happens we've got a, a couple more than that, so you might say on a basketball team maybe it's six players averaging double figures. But it means that your offense has a, a great deal of diversity, which means that the other team then is unable to load up on particular individuals uh, because they know that those are the individuals that are going to see the ball most of the time or do most of the shooting as it would be on a basketball team. And I thought that was real evident in, in watching the NCAA tournament, the basketball tournament this last weekend. But there were a couple teams, you know, IU in particular, who was very, very diverse in their offense, and it was real difficult for uh, UCLA to, to, to play def against, defense against them, where on the other hand, you looked at the UCLA and they had a couple of kids that they really depended upon and IU keyed on those individuals and UCLA, UCLA struggled. Uh, you know, Duke was a little bit the same way. They're real diversified. Uh, Cincinnati appears to be that way. They're, they're a fun team to watch, but, but it, re it re really is a direct relationship to that in regards to the diversity. And so it makes it difficult for other teams to defense us. How common is it for a, a setter? to have 100 kills in a season. I mean, we're not even, what, three, I guess we're three quarters of the way through the season maybe now. 100 kills is kind of an unusual statistic for a setter, isn't it? Well, it is, but Loy is a real integral part of our offense, uh, and he has to be in order to make the other parts work. Uh, once again, because of his size, uh, he becomes an offensive threat when he's in the front row, and we use him like that. And of course, he's also able to take over passes and, and attack those kinds of balls and those count and kills. And, and we also move him around in our blocking scheme. And so part of the time, he ends up blocking on our left side, the opponent's right side. And he actually, in transition, becomes an attacker. Uh, so because he's offensive minded and because we want him to be offensive minded, uh, and it is unusual that a setter would have over 100 kills in a year, uh, but it's not unusual for someone of Loy's size and nature and the way we implement him in our in our team defense. Our kids seem to really enjoy the block and I know that really motivates the crowd and so forth and I was uh, uh, very impressed with the fact that this weekend both uh, Loy and Tom Junkie were uh, able to go by the uh, the season block assist record of, of 93. Uh, Loy has 119 I believe and Tom 116. 
And again, we're not all the way through the season. I was sitting down at my uh, desk this afternoon trying to figure out where that might equate. And if they were to keep going at this, this level through the remainder of the season, they could end up with almost 145 block assists for uh, a season for both of them. Uh, those are pretty impressive numbers. Well, once again, Jim, uh, numbers really don't mean a whole lot. To, I mean, it's something for kids to look at and something for you to put national rankings and all that kind of thing. But the, the secret there is to get the players to understand that if you're going to be a good team uh, playing defense, that the block has got to be the initial happening. If the block forms like it's supposed to, then it's fairly easy to play defense behind it. Of course, if the block terminates the ball, it's a heck of a lot easier to play defense by it because you don't have to. Uh, we've, we've spent quite a bit of time on blocking. I'm not real pleased with what we're doing right now blocking-wise. We seem to be out of control a little bit with our hands in particular, and we've got to get ourselves a little more disciplined in regards to that. Uh, certainly, we have touched a lot of balls. I think we set a school record against USC in blocks. Uh, uh, but once again, those things don't mean anything if, you, if they don't equate into, into Ws. And fortunately, for the most part, that's happened. Uh, but against the really good teams, uh, such as Santa Barbara uh, and Ball State and, and those kinds of teams uh, who pass the ball well, uh, blocking becomes even more critical. And being able to get yourself in a position to intercept the ball before it comes over the net so that your backcourt players can play defense becomes even more critical. Uh, you know, Tom and Loy have touched a lot of balls. Uh, Pepe Rolot leads the team in solo blocks. Freshman kid, middle blocker for us. Uh, so we have gotten better. Uh, but our backcourt defense has not gotten better to the point that it needs to be, as you guys witnessed this weekend. The um, weekend started off very well for us with the, uh, the victory over Irvine. Did not finish quite as well with a five-game loss to Santa Barbara, the first loss on our, our court this year. The, the impact of that Santa Barbara loss, we were talking a little bit about about it before we went on the air. Um, I'm sure our audience would like to know your impressions of the loss as far as its impact on, on the season. And there are a few things you were talking about with me that it, um, and your thoughts on it were certainly different than what I had would have imagined. What kind of an impact does that Santa Barbara loss have for us? Well, if we play well the rest of the year and able to be successful in the MIVA tournament, it doesn't have any impact at all. <laughs> Uh, if that's not the case, uh, the bid to the NCAA tournament is an at-large bid. There are, uh, there's only one automatic bid to the NCAA finals, and that's out of the WEFA conference out west. All the other bids are at-large bids. Now, in the history of the tournament, they've always come from our conference, and the one out east, and then the, the at-large, the true at-large bid has always come from the west. And I don't see that that will change. Uh, but both the uh, EIVA and the W or the MIVA, the one we belong to, all have season-ending tur ending tournaments, and in the past have recommended that team that wins the tournament for the uh, championship. Uh, about two or three years ago, when the championship was at George Mason, there was an exception to that, and out west, and the USC went when UCLA actually won the tournament, and. The impact that it could possibly have would be that if we were to somehow or other lose to Ohio State or Ball State at the MIVA tournament, uh, having provided we can beat both of them, Ohio State tomorrow night and, uh, and Ball State here when they come in the 11th, having beaten those guys three or four times apiece, uh, there's always a possibility that the NCAA committee might say, well, we're going to take IPFW instead of uh, either Ohio State or Ball State if they were to win the tournament. And the impact that Santa Barbara loss has in regards to that is that Santa Barbara had just beaten Northridge, which was ranked number three in the country. Uh, of course, we had we beaten USC twice, and if we would have could have beaten Santa Barbara, then we have some legitimate uh, uh, concern or legitimate uh, uh, call to be possibly uh, the at-large bid from the Midwest, in re even if we didn't win the, the MIVA tournament. That could have some real ramifications with the tournament being at, at Ball State. If, say, Ball State were to have been the champions, do you really 
anticipate that the selection committee would still say it's at Ball State, Ball State won the tournament, but we're taking IPFW? Well, I think that's always a possibility. There are three people on that committee that vote and decide, and one of them has to be the AD at Ball State. <laughs> uh, but, you know, two out of three has to have to decide, I guess, and it's always a possibility. Uh, and there's an easy solution to that. We just go over and win the AMIVA tournament and not worry about it. But uh, the Santa Barbara loss could indeed affect us in that regard. The um, match coming up tomorrow night against Ohio State has some major impact, as you were just alluding to, as far as uh, the way things are going within the, uh, the MIVA. Uh, we were just talking about the fact that uh, Ohio State took a uh, West Coast trip and didn't win a, a game out on the West Coast. Uh, what are we looking for out of, out of Pete's team now? Are they going through a mid-year slump, or are they just playing some really tough teams and taking their licks? combination of both. Uh, a young man by the name of uh, Mike Terpstra, who is their leading player, has been hurt. Uh, got hurt just before they played Ball State a couple weeks ago, and I don't know what the extent that he played out on the West Coast. And he certainly is by far their, well, I shouldn't say by far, but he is their best player and they depend on him to pass and also to be their terminator offensively, so I'm sure the loss of him has, has hurt Pete and the Buckeyes over there. Uh, I anticipate that he will be back uh, to play tomorrow evening, and certainly after taking their lumps out on the West Coast, they're going to be looking for somebody to whoop on, <laughs> and uh, here we are uh, with a long trip over there in the middle of the week uh, to play in St. John's, John's Arena. Uh, it'll be a good match. I'm sure that, that uh, the Ohio State's kids will be uh, ready to play and our kids know what, what's at stake and we'll be ready to play also. Kind of a good news, bad news situation for us, but we'll get back and talk a little bit more about this uh, Ohio State match in the upcoming weekend. But right now, let's take a break and uh, with Alan Bangs and Sports Break. Here's an IPFW Sports Minute. I'm Alan Bangs. Last Friday it became official. IPFW senior Lisa Miller was named to the 1991-92 Kodak NCAA Division II All-American team as voted on by the Women's Basketball Coaches Association. Miller, who earlier this month was selected the Great Lakes Valley Conference Player of the Year, ranked second in the nation in scoring. She also set NCAA Division II records for most free throws made and attempted in a season. Miller finished her career with 2,358 points placing her seventh on the NCAA Division II scoring chart. She was instrumental in leading IPFW to a 22-7 record and a berth in postseason tournament play. Lisa is the first IPFW player to earn All-American honors. She was an honorable mention All-American a year ago. The sixth-ranked 21-7 IPFW men's volleyball team heads to Muncie, Indiana to join Ball State for their Volley Card Classic this Friday and Saturday. Friday night, the Volley Dons take on Penn State at 6.30 p.m. Saturday, also at 6.30, the Volley Dons will meet George Mason University. Last weekend, the Volley Dons split a pair of matches at the Barrett and McNegney Spring Fling here in Fort Wayne. Friday night, IPFW romped against the University of California, Irvine, 15-11, 15-10, and 15-7. Saturday night, IPFW fell for the second time this season to UC Santa Barbara, in a marathon five-game match. The score Saturday night were 15-10, 15-7, 10-15, 11-15, and 15-7. In other spring sports, the IPFW men's tennis team has opened their season on a strong note, posting an overall record of 4-1 to start the season. This Thursday, the tennis team has a home match against Olivet University. Action gets underway at the campus tennis course at 3.30 Thursday. Saturday, the tennis team will be on the road at Indianapolis University. And that's a look at sports. Now back to Jim and the volleyball guru for more Arnie Ball Show. Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. And we'll lead off this half of the show with Volleyball 101. Today's topic, Coach, is going to be serving. Um, let's start first with we'll divided into two parts. We'll talk about serving technique and then serving strategy. Uh, what does it take as far as keys for serving to be uh, a successful server? I know it drives you nuts when they're not, but what does it take to be successful? Well, Jim, maybe we 
Um, let me change the subject just for a second here, okay? Because <laughs> I have a request from Greg. We haven't talked to Greg all day today, but I have a request uh, to Greg. Greg, I've been putting in a lot of hours trying to, you know, with this team and stuff, and it'd be really helpful to me if you get a sofa instead of this stinking chair that I have to sit in all the time so I can <laughs> lay down while we do this interview and, and, and rest just a little bit. It's okay, well, so if you take a look at that, I'd appreciate it uh, very much, and, and uh, my body would appreciate it also. To be a good server, you got to get it over the net. That you know, helps. that's what we keep telling our kids. Get it over the net somehow or another. And we seem to have some trouble doing that at the right time. To really be a good server, and it really depends on what, what you're trying to accomplish as a server. In some cases, it's getting over the net. Uh, and the higher the level uh, of play, the more you're, you're trying to place the ball, either in a jump serve manner or a floater serve manner. And there are all kinds of different techniques to, float, to serve a floater serve. So we won't get into those right now. Uh, but the real purpose, obviously, is to get the ball to the net to make the other team play the ball. Now, th there's even some conditions there. Uh, the frustrating part for me uh, as, as a coach in serving is when you serve it under or into the net. And in our case, Saturday night, Pepe served one into the standard. And Loy served one under the net. Uh, because then the team on the other side never has to make a decision. All they do is just cheer and jump around and go, yay, look at those buffoons over there. They served it under the net or outside the post or they hit the coach. Or hit the, I mean, Neil Day out in California hit the other player's bench, cleared the bench out. And we did that on purpose just to get them all excited and hopefully some of them fall down and get hurt. And unfortunately, it didn't work that way. But, but that was a strategy that Neil had ahead of time, he told me. Uh, right. So the real key is, is really to get the ball over the net so the other team has to make some kind of decision on where the ball's in or out. <clears throat> because at least then they have to communicate and they have to make, make those decisions. Uh, in serving, once again, the lower the level, I think the harder the serve, the better. Uh, not necessarily true the higher level. It's the placement as well as the hardness of the serve, whether it be once again a floater or a jump serve. Placement becomes very important in serving because if you find somebody over there that you can see their knees are knocking, you go after them. And there are some other, other reasons why you serve that way as well. If we're looking at serving strategies, uh, a lot of the, f the fans will be uh, sitting at home watching on TV. They'll be in the stands and they'll see uh, uh, Coach Johnson with the, uh, the notepad and giving hand signs as to serving signals for the, uh, the players. What is he actually asking the players to do? And having been in that position, I know you can ask them, but it may not always come true. Because uh, <laughs> there was many times when you would look down at me and say, what did you call? <laughs> what, are you, what are you actually trying to do? I mean, what are the first couple of rules we're looking for as far as picking on somebody or serving a specific area? Actually, Jim, what Coach Johnson is doing is uh, we're really working on our math skills. Is that, is that? Working on our math skills because we found that our our players are a little deficient in their in their recognition of their of numbers. Numbers of numbers, and it's still pretty amazing because we we have found that they still don't recognize the numbers even after we give them to them, as you alluded to before, <laughs> because Coach Johnson will give them a one, and and after they've served, as you as you mentioned, I'll look down and say, hey. What was that supposed to be? And he'll say, well, that was supposed to be a one. But, I, but my response is, but it went to zone five. Well, he said, I'm sorry, coach, but they just can't count numbers. <laughs> so we're working on their number skills. He's trying to get them to serve to a certain position on the floor. There are six zones on the floor, and they're numbered one through six. And you'll see him use his fingers one through five, and then a fist is number six. He'll also use a thumbs up, which is a jump serve, meaning that we want you to jump serve and not particularly in any zone, but just get it over, uh, even though we can go jump serve five, and, we'll, and we're also able to do that. So what we're trying to do is to serve the ball in a certain area, and there are a number of reasons. One I alluded to earlier is it may be just a poor passer over there. Uh, one, one may be that, indeed, if we make a certain passer move a certain direction, then they can't get back in, an, in the opposite direction to be able to attack the ball, so now we load our blockers up somewhere else. Um, one, one may be that because of the system they are running, uh, that it's advantageous for us to serve a ball short or deep into the court, which once again eliminates part of their offense, which then gives us an opportunity to load up our blockers. Santa Barbara did a great job against us on Saturday night doing that. 
and I'm sure that Coach Preston had that design. I tried to make a switch on our team, and our players didn't adjust very well, and we, we had trouble with it. But that, those are, though, that is what he's doing, is giving the different signals for the players to serve in different areas of the court. Good. The uh, serving, obviously, is the quickest way to score points, and that's uh, sometimes the, what will drive coaches nuts faster than anything else are missed serves. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about serving strategy as we, as we go along. I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, the upcoming matches this weekend at the Volley Card Classic. Um, we've got George Mason and Penn State coming in. Uh, Penn State did not go out west, as everybody else seems to have gone this this year. Uh, they chose to stay at home. Um, what kind of impact do you think that will have on on them as uh, as a team? I don't know. We haven't seen Penn State for quite a while. You know, we've played them over at their place, and we've played them here at our place uh, early in the year and beat them both times. I understand that uh, last evening they lost to Rutgers in five, uh, but I don't know how Rutgers is playing either. That was at Penn State, uh, by the way. Hmm. Um, I, I think that it will hurt them a, a little bit. However, they have had UCLA uh, out to their place, okay. and they've had Stanford out to their place. Stanford just beat them last weekend, I think, three, three zip. Uh, that was what I saw the scores were. Uh, so they have got a chance to play some of the good California schools in the last, uh, well, at least last week, uh, in regards to Stanford in particular. Uh, they've also played Manitoba, which is a real strong team out of Canada. So they have played some good teams. Uh, I just don't know much about how they're playing right now. We know their personnel hasn't changed, and they still have a real short sitter, and they still have David Muir. Other than that, we just have to wait and see who, who, who shows up for them and what they're doing. David Muir seems to be the key to their whole offensive and in some cases defensive scheme. They play as David plays. Uh, any special strategies we have lined up for him? Are we going to try and go one-on-one -on -one blocking with him or match up with him, or are we just going to let him serve tough and hopefully he never gets the ball? Yeah, we'll try and match up uh, Norman and Loy with him a little bit, but you know they set him out the back row too, which means that sometime or other we're going to have our shorter people opposite him. Uh, our main concern with him is just to touch some balls that he hits and, and run them down and transition them. And we'll really concentrate on the rest of the guys. Uh, uh, they've got a middle hitter that's uh, real good, and we'll have to try and get in front of him and slow him down a little bit. Obviously, we'll try and set over the top of their little setter and, and utilize uh, use him. And then they have a couple outside kids who are real up and down type players. They either play real well or, or they don't play very well. And so we'll try and also neutralize those kids. We're really going. We'll really concentrate on the rest of the team and let Dave kind of do his thing mm -hmm. and touch him and then run him down. They seem to be a team that rides the emotional roller coaster big time. Fair assessment or not? Certainly is, and we're going to play them on Friday night, which means they're going to have driven all the way out here uh, from um, College Town and and be a little flat and a little whatever. And having just come off that loss from Rutgers, they're going to probably be wondering about themselves a little bit. Uh, so the key for us is to come out and, and get on them right away and not let them get an, an emotional high. And if they don't, then, then I think we can defeat them. You know, a team that we used to hear a great deal about out of the East, in addition to Penn State, obviously, uh, was George Mason. It's been real quiet this year about uh, the, the Patriots. What's, what's happening with them? I really don't know. Uh, you look at their personnel, and, and they've got some really nice players. Mm -hmm. Scott Metcalf, who's a big middle hitter for them, is it's good boy, I'd like to have him. He's a nice player. He's a stud. Uh, they've got a kid from France that, that's a real nice player. Uh, they have a setter. I, I believe the setter's from Brazil or Puerto Rico or he's from somewhere down south, and, and he's a nice player. I mean, they've got some real nice personnel. They just, have, for some reason, they've not seemed to gel, and I, and I don't know why, why that is. Is this something that's a problem with a lot of the, the teams that are having multinational players and it, they, it takes them a lot longer to get themselves together it seems. Well I think that's a that's a fair observation. You know we've had we've had a little bit of that difficulty with our team with uh, uh, the young men that we have from Puerto Rico and then the kids from this country and and uh, not the fact that they dislike one another that's not the point at all it's it's but it's the difference in their cultural backgrounds and and our Puerto Rican kids have a tendency to fall back into the Spanish, and, and our, our, our kids have a tendency, the kids from the, the continental United States have a tendency to get a little offensive, uh, offensive at that because they, they're speaking Spanish, they can't understand what they say. And so I can't imagine what it's like when you got one from South America and one from Germany and one from France and one from here and one from there. 
uh, they got to, it's got to be difficult. And I think Rutgers is going through some of that difficulty as well. You know, the Soviet players they have don't speak English. And the assistant coach <laughs> speaks Russian, so that's how they interpret it. And, you know, when you get on the floor, I mean, body language is one thing, eye-to-eye -eye contact is one thing, but when it comes right down to it, you got to talk to one another. And it makes it pretty difficult. I think the, uh, the Puerto Ricans we have on our, our team have, have worked very hard at trying to get involved with the, uh, the program and adapt to the United States culture. And I, I think a lot of credit goes to them because they've just been joys to have around. The, um, the international aspect doesn't seem to have the major impact, I guess, on our team as it, as it does on some of the others. The, um, the Mason team, you know, they, they could be a real problem for us if they decide to wake up sometime. As you say, they've got the, the players. They play Ball State first, and That's they're correct. going to run the same type format we had this last weekend? That's correct. We play ball, uh, Penn State at 630, and Ball State and George Mason play at 830, and then we flip on Saturday night. So we get to play uh, play the first game both nights. And That's correct. And that means we life. get to be home early, so I like that. That's great. Well, we look forward to uh, seeing you people over at uh, Ohio State on Wednesday and, and again down at the uh, the Classic this weekend. Three more victories would be very nice for us. One more victory, what, ties or puts us ahead of the uh, ties, I guess, our most number of victories in the season. So uh, I don't know. Dave Hilbert takes care of all that <laughs> stuff. We just, I just Mr. play Stat one Man. game at a time. And I don't worry about the numbers. Well, we look forward to... Uh, Another good week and uh, get things rolling again, and we'll be uh, anxious to see how things come out, and we'll talk about it again next week. Thanks for all your time this week, Coach. Right, appreciate thank it. Thank you, Jim. See you, Greg. You have a good week. Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. I'm your host, Jim Orr. Coach, let's uh, start off this week talking a little bit about the, uh, the Ohio mm -hmm. State match. Uh, team was involved in a marathon match, at least for, it seemed like a marathon, I'm sure, for you from the beginning to the end as far as getting there and the team playing. It took almost uh, two hours, four games. Um, I was a little bit concerned. It seemed like the team was a little bit sluggish. Is, is, there, is that a fair assessment? Are they having some physical problems or... What seems to be going on? Well, I don't know, Jim, it's kind of a difficult question for me to ask. You know, uh, when we first started this show, I was really on a roll, and Greg <laughs> stopped us. And now, now I'm kind of a loss for words. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to say here. So uh, if what I say doesn't make much sense, well, we'll blame Greg just because he interrupted us in, in starting the show here. Um, I think it's a combination of a lot of things, uh, or a number of things, uh, one being uh, that it's during the middle of the week. It's three and a half hours to four hours, depending on how quickly we drive and how many uh, Ohio State troopers we happen to see <laughs> uh, over there. Uh, obviously, we travel we travel in vans, uh, which is a little little bit of a cramped quarters. Uh, you try and go early enough so that the kids can get out and walk around a little bit, stretch, do their thing. Uh, but if you get there too early, then they stand around, and look at one another, like 
stumps on a log, you know, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing, and or bumps on a log, I guess, cause God, not stumps on a log, but uh, so, and we were there early enough that they could they could uh, come out and do some serving and passing in St. John's, and for some of the kids who have never played in St. John's, that's a massive place, as you know, and so it's an adjustment <coughs> for, for those kids uh, in regards to playing there. Uh, we have played Ohio State, I guess, up to that point. We had played them at least twice and and had, uh, well, actually three times and had beaten them uh, pretty easily every each time. Uh, so it's, it's difficult for the kids to get to mentally prepared and focused like I would like for them to be. Um, the other thing that happened was we started a different lineup, uh, one that we had practiced all one day. And we moved Pepe to the outside to pass the first game. And uh, he's passed very, very little. And so it made us a little tentative, even though I thought Pepe did a really nice job passing the ball. Yeah, I thought so too. We never really did get uh, out of that sluggishness that you referred to. Uh, once again, I don't know whether it's because uh, of the travel, it's because of the, uh, of the time um, and during the middle of the week, or the fact that we're playing in St. John's and it's uh, such a massive building and there are probably, what, 200 people in there? Maybe. Give or take a, a body here or there. And so there's really no atmosphere in regards to an athletic event. And so all those things make it a culmination of a, of a fairly flat match. And Ohio State didn't cooperate very well because they were really flat too. And so when both teams are flat, then it just becomes pretty ugly. The, uh, you referred to St. John Arena, and having been over there several times and uh, having been with you when we coached over there and, and things like this, how much of a difference does that make as far as perception on, on our players' part? I mean, the court doesn't change, obviously, but certainly the surroundings makes a big difference for the, for the players. It take a while for them to get used to it, it seems. Well, that's the reason we try and go early, so the kids can adjust to that, but it isn't any different than any other athletic team going to a different facility. Uh, you know, basketballs, the arenas are, are the same way, uh, just like volleyball courts are like that. Baseball diamonds are different shapes and sizes and forms. And, and uh, so it, it, it takes some quite of an adjustment, especially the kids who pass the ball. It takes an adjustment for those kids. It takes an adjustment for everybody in regards to serving the ball. Mm -hmm. Once again, because of the depth perception more than anything else and just the large spaces uh, that those arenas uh, have available. As far as the rest of the players are concerned, I don't think it affects it a whole lot. You know, as you alluded to, the court is 30 feet wide, it's 60 feet long, no matter where you go. Doesn't make any difference. And so setting the ball is really insignificant in regards to that space. Um, and so it, it takes a little bit of adjustment, but if as, as, long, as much as we have played this year, I mean, it should be a real small period of time of adjustment, and, and the kids should be able to go on. Um, how does this compare, say, to the new gym at uh, Ball State? I haven't been down there to, to see that one. Is Ohio State's gym, St. John's, much bigger? They've essentially the same type format. Do you anticipate any problems down there with that? Should we get lucky enough to the Final Four? Well, I don't think so. We've played down there three matches now, uh, one against Ball State, uh, then against Penn State and George Mason. It's a different uh, design as far as the facility is concerned. It's more circular than what St. John's is. Uh, it's not nearly as high. St. John's goes up forever. forever. It seems like, uh, you know, if you get up in the top section, you know, if you ever fell out, you just keep falling forever. Uh, so if Ball State's arena is different from that perspective. I think that the Ball State arena is a little noisier uh, mm -hmm. than maybe what the one at uh, Ohio State is, uh, but the one at Ohio State is made out of all wooden bleachers and wooden seats. Uh, the one at Ball State is made out of uh, appears to be plastic uh, seats and aluminum bench seats, mm -hmm. and the walls are, are aluminum or steel or some kind of a metal structure, and so the noise level, you know, the noises just bounce around in there, as compared to what they might in St. John's. But I really don't anticipate uh, any problem if we get a chance to go down there. We've we played down there enough now to have adjusted. What were your feelings on uh, uh, the lineup change with with Pepe and uh, Norman switching spots on that? Uh, they, how do, how will be? You went back to the, the lineup that you originally would go with. I think in game two, um, your assessment of how did you like that, or were you going to just kind of scrap that for another time? Actually, I, I, I did like it, but we won't go back to it. <laughs> Uh, what we found out was is that uh, Pepe can help us in, in handling the ball as a middle hitter. Mm -hmm. And so that gives us an, an additional 
uh, opportunity that we didn't have, an option that we didn't have in the past. Um, we inserted in the Ohio State match, we inserted Chad in the lineup at Norman's spot at the opposite. And I won't do that again either. However, it worked. Uh, Chad came in and really picked the team up emotionally, uh, physically, made some great diving you know, plays, uh, stuck a couple balls on the outside, but just added, added some energy to us that we didn't have, that we haven't had for a while. Uh, and it has that uh, go-for-everything attitude that uh, we need to develop a little more of well, with, with all of our personnel. Uh, so I, I liked what I saw, uh, but we, and we played it the, the same way the second game. If you recall, I think you were there the second game, and we lost the game. Unfortunately, it wasn't Pepe's fault, but I just felt that, that we were in a position where we needed to get back with a lineup that we felt comfortable with so that we could go ahead and hopefully win the match. So we went back to the original lineup that we've been going with pretty much all year in game three and uh, didn't do a lot of good. We're down nine to six. Mm -hmm. And I look at Denny and Denny looks at me and I go, we got to do something different. So we throw Chad in. Uh, at the opposite spot where Craig Collins was playing and just tell Lloyd to swing him to the outside, gives us a small block uh, with uh, he in there next to Raul. But what the heck, at that point, we just needed some energy. And at 9-6 in the third game, we throw him in there, and we win 15-9. Ohio State never scores. And so in game four, we went back uh, to our original lineup again with Craig in the opposite, or Quentin, one of the two. I'm not, I'm not recall for sure. And we get down 9-6. to six. Same scenario. In goes Chad. Same spot. Boom, we win 15-9. They never scored again. So we had to look at that and go, well, wait a minute, maybe there's something about Chad being in the lineup that adds some, some kind of chemistry to our team. And so when we, when we looked at that, uh, we actually made some changes uh, in one day <laughs> uh, that I think have proven to be very beneficial. Chad seemed to be the type of player that uh, jumps on the court and says, I'm going to serve you tough and give me your best shot and I'm going to I'm going to dig you. Uh, you're not going to beat me. It seems like that was the attitude he brought on the court with him at Ohio State. Um, did he continue to play that well at the Volley Card Classic? Or I didn't get to see that matches at all. Chad, uh, Chad brings to the team and to himself uh, the attitude that he, that he has uh, one shot. Hard, harder, and harder, and he plays defense the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that's not all, all good, but 99% of the time that's good. I'd rather have a player that way and have to tone him down a little bit than trying to have to boost him up all the time. So we went down to Ohio, or to Ball State to the tournament, down to their tournament, uh, played Penn State the first night, and we started right out with uh, Chad in an outside position. So what I've done is I've put Norman opposite, which is really where Norman belongs mm -hmm. and has belonged all year. We just haven't figured out a way out to get it done because we've really been working with Craig, you know, to make him an opposite. And he just has not come along as quickly as we think he needs to in order for us to compete for a national championship. Uh, so what we've done is put Norman opposite uh, next to Raul, and we let Raul and Norman pass uh, out of those two positions, which is really a, an irregular serve reception pattern. But it's got a number of benefits for us. It gives, first of all, it gives us a chance to have Pat, Chad play and he doesn't have to pass the ball, mm -hmm. or he can come in and help us pass, which he did this weekend, which is really a benefit to us. Uh, and it's allowed us then uh, to play Quentin and Pepe in that lineup, both of which are, are legitimate back row attackers and give us a bigger block. Mm -hmm. uh, so we ended up starting that lineup, and shoot, they played really well against Penn State. And the first two games. And then I made a switch in game three and put in Tom and uh, Neil in the middles and put Craig in Chad's spot because we think Craig, Craig at this point uh, could help us uh, in an outside spot because he, all he has to do is just swing outside and hit the ball. He not worry about combination and have set the ball or a lot of things that would allow him just to use his athletic ability out there. Unfortunately, they, that group lost to Penn State in game three even though we were ahead uh, and we just 
made a couple bad choices on on serve reception, made a couple serving errors, and it wasn't necessarily that group's fault, but that happened. Yeah. So after that, then we went back to uh, the other group, and they came back and won game uh, uh, four fairly easily. On Saturday night against George Mason, I flipped them, and I started Neil and Tom and Craig, along with uh, Raul and Norman and Loy. And um, boy, we came out and smoked them the first two games. And so then game three, I came back with Quentin and, uh, and Chad and Pepe, and we won again. And fortunately down there, I was also able, I got Derek some playing time, and he did a really nice job. Juan on Friday night came in and served four or five balls in a row just to, to bring us back and to, to win a game. And he also came in for Norman and gave Norman some blow time. So I was able all, the, all this last weekend to play 12 players. And actually what's beginning to evolve, Jim, is two groups. The core group being Loy and Norman and Raul. And then the interchangeable parts being uh, Craig, Tom, and Neil. And the reason we've lined Craig up with that bunch is because he's a little bigger, which offers us a bigger opportunity for a block and some other things, and, and plays next to Tom, who's of the shorter, of the shorter nature. And then if you put Chad in with the bigger blockers, it just gives us that balance. So we've been able to interchange uh, nine players uh, back and forth. And Juan has come in and helped us with uh, Raul and Norman's spot because that's the other passing spot. So we've really developed in the, in the last week and a half some depth uh, at a number of positions that I guess I knew we had, but I never, I never had our people in the right spot to take advantage of it. It would seem that the flexibility we're talking about is also going to allow us the, the opportunity to then, uh, regardless of who we're, we're playing at any particular time, a wide variety of matchups. Well, it certainly gives us an opportunity to look at what the other team offers and see which lineup is best for us, either size-wise or quickness-wise, or what we're looking for. And I think that obviously is a real plus. The other thing that it's done, uh, you know, I think we talked last week, uh, we were beginning and probably are still a little bit uh, tired, mm -hmm. physically and mentally tired. <clears throat> so it's given me a chance to rest some people uh, this last week and a half that we've not done, not been able to all, all year. Now, unfortunately, I really haven't been able to rest Loy and Raul enough. Those two kids really sure. need some downtime, but they're not going to get it. <laughs> well, we'll... Uh... Speaking of rest, we'll give you a bit of a rest and we'll uh, take a uh, short recess and go into sports break with Alan Bangs and we'll come back to Volleyball 101. Oh. Here's a Channel 6 Sports Minute. I'm Alan Bangs. The Volley Dons left Muncie, Indiana with a pair of victories in the Ball State Volley Card Classic this weekend. On Friday night, the Dons walloped George Mason University in three sets, 15-8, 15-8, and 15-12. Norman Almodovar led IPFW with 11 kills. Loy Ball had 44 assists. The Dons needed four games to beat Penn State on Saturday night. The scores were 15-11, 15-10, 14-16, and 15-10. Felipe Rolat, Norman Almodovar, Quinton Spiegel, and Raul Papaleo all reached double figures in the kill column. Al Motivar and Spiegel had 22 apiece. On Saturday, Loy Ball became the school's career assist leader when he recorded his 3,000th, 189th assist. That broke Phil Bodine's mark. Bodine wore a Volley Don uniform from 1985 to 1988. Ball enters this week with 3,234 lifetime assists. The 24-7 Volley Dons entertained Ball State University in a Midwest Intercollegiate Volleyball Association match this Saturday at the Multipurpose Center. Action gets underway at 7.30, and of course, Channel 6 will carry that game live. IPFW has won 11 straight MEVA matches dating back to last year. The IPFW men's tennis team dropped a pair of matches this past week to run their overall record to 5-3, and 3-2 in the Great Lakes Valley Conference. After a 4-0 start, the tennis team has dropped three of their last four. This Friday, they'll host Tri-State University for a non-conference match. Action gets underway at the campus course at 3 p.m. Sunday, St. Joseph's and Southern Indiana will visit IPFW for a three-way conference match. Sunday's matches are underway bright and early at 9 a.m. 
And that's a look at sports. For Channel 6, I'm Alan Banks. Now back to the show. Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. We'll start off this segment with Volleyball 101. Our topic this afternoon, Coach, is going to be do's and don'ts of serving. And we'll talk about uh, some of the things you should do when you serve. And uh, if time permits, maybe some of the things you shouldn't do. So let's uh, just jump right in and uh, give us some of your basic rules. I know a lot of the new uh, volleyball players and coaches may not always be aware of all the rules, but not everybody has the... Uh, the luxury of having somebody call serves for them and things like that. So what are some of the things we have to look for as a new server? Well, if indeed you were the first server of the game, and I know that Greg would do this because he's just real, real competent at the, everything that he does. But if you were the first server of the match, the first thing you should do is go to the umpire with the ball and make sure there's enough air in it. Okay? Because nine times out of ten, when the first serve of the match takes place and the ball is an aired serve, there's usually not enough air in the ball. That's usually, almost always the case. And so that's the first thing that I recommend that the serve, first <laughs> server do, is you check to make sure there's enough air in the ball. And if there isn't, that you make sure you insist that indeed they put enough air in the ball. Okay? That's rule number one. Rule number two is get it over when you're the first server to open the match. There's nothing that is any more discouraging uh, to your teammates or to your coach or to you to have gone out there and as the team captain, and it might be you, and have called the flip correctly and get a chance to choose to serve or receive, and you've got the chance to serve first and then you go back and you make an error. So one of, the, one of the real cardinal rules in serving is if you're the first server, get it over. And I know last week we talked about positions and areas and so on and so forth, and those are still important as a first server, but the most important thing is to get it over. And it's even more important, or just as important, as the first server to get it over the net, even if you hit it out of bounds. Now that's still discouraging, and it's still something you don't want to do, but at least the other team has to call in or out. And it doesn't make any difference if you serve it underhand, sidearm, stand on your head and kick it over. That's illegal. You can't do that one. But get it over so that indeed the other, cho other team has to handle the ball and give you an opportunity to score. I just think that's, that's one of the most critical things that we overlook uh, in the game because the first serve a great deal of the time in every game helps dictate the momentum of the game for your team, just like if you're receiving and you're able to side out the first time, handle the ball three times perfectly, it helps set the, the tone for your, your team. You know, if you listen to uh, a lot of basketball coaches, and Coach Knight in particular, he will talk about how important it is to come out in the second half and play really well for the first five minutes. I mean, I've heard him talk and talk and talk about that. Well, the same thing is true here in regards to serving because the very first thing that we do to get started is that serve and the very first full rotation of all six players should be a, a, a mindset that indeed we're going to get to serve over and make them handle the ball because if you go through the first three rota or six rotations and half of your players or a third of your players, which is just two, have served the ball in the net or out of bounds, you know, a third of the time, the other team has got to relax and not had, had any pressure put on them in order to get the serve back. So those, those, the early part of the game is real critical. Most people would say, ah, it's the late part of the game that's real critical. Well, that's critical too, don't get me wrong. Uh, the middle part's also important, but the initial part of, of the game in serving is really important, I believe, in being able to establish some kind of of uh, momentum, some, some kind of atmosphere for your team because there's nothing more discouraging than to work like the devil on defense and then throw the ball away. It's called turnovers. All you basketball junkies understand turnovers. Volleyball is the same thing. A turnover is nothing more than handling the ball badly 
or making a service error because a service error is something that is uncontested just like a free throw and those there really is no excuse for missing those now there's some other other do's in regards to serving as well after the other team calls a timeout it's very important that you serve the ball over the net and in the court because the other team usually calls timeout to break your momentum it's important and very seldom does this happen but it does happen occasionally that after you call a timeout and you happen to be serving because you you you've done it and this happened to us last year it hasn't happened yet this year but it happened to us last year down at the MA, MIVA championships and I still believe it was the reason that we won uh, the, the the match down there is that we were serving and I called timeout to tell my team exactly what Ball State was going to do because we had charted it and they did it and we had our defense in front of it and we shut it down so you know that becomes real important also if you're a substitute and you come into the game, you come in for a particular reason. It's either the block balls you come in the front row, but usually you come in to serve. Serve the ball over the net and into the court. Otherwise, you become kind of useless when you first come into the game, and it develops your attitude as a player when you serve the ball in the net or out of bounds. We believe that after 12 points, all serves need to be in the court. Because after 12 points, the pressure all then reverts back to the offensive team because they have to handle the ball, as I said before, three times. You have to pass on serve, set the ball, and spike the ball on the court. And if you go back at 12-12 and serve the ball in the net, it just gives them a reprieve. Mm -hmm. So we also believe that at that particular time is when you have to go back and be real careful with the ball. I think it's real interesting. I, I watched... Uh, uh, the Duke game, the Duke of Michigan game last night, and I don't know whether you heard the quote by Bo Schimbeckler or not, but apparently he went back and talked to the Michigan basketball team, and he said, you know, I, at first I didn't like you guys. I didn't like you at all. And the reason I didn't like you is because you didn't take care of the basketball. All you did was throw it away. Or you didn't have a concern for its well-being. Well, volleyball is the same way. You have to care about the ball. You have to take care of the ball when it's yours. And when it's yours, in particular in serving, you have to make sure that the other team has to handle the ball. Now, certainly there are times in a rally scoring game, for instance, is let's say you're down 12-6. Well, the only way in a rally score game that you're going to have a chance and get behind is to go back and serve the ball really tough, which means you may make some errors. Okay. Because at that point, you have nothing to lose and therefore, we're, we're back jump serving, we're back trying to serve the ball right in the corners in order for them to mishandle the ball or for us to ace them so we can catch up. So there are times when you have to gamble with the serve. But it's not after 12s, and it's not the first serve, and it's not when you substitute or the other team is called timeout. Good enough. We'll uh, be getting some additional insight on serving when we have uh, <laughs> the seniors come in next week, and we'll talk to them about serving strategies because a lot of them have been serving a great many balls. I um, want to talk a little bit about uh, Penn State and George Mason. Penn State, the beast of the East, um, beat them in four again, and yet uh, uh, we've had very little problem with them this year. We talked a little bit Monday, I think it was, and you're picking Penn State to come out of the East yet over Rutgers. So your thoughts on that? Well, we've been real fortunate with those guys. Uh, every time we've played them, we've served really well. And they have... Uh, one position right now that passes pretty well in Tommy Ginrich, a left-handed boy who's a senior. The other position is a, kind of a question mark for them. And so we've been fortunate enough every time we play them to serve well and go after that position, which really has helped neutralize David Muir, who, who is their really premier attacker. Uh, it also helps neutralize Jimmy Shaw, who is their setter and is, is small in nature. Uh, and with, when that's happened, uh, why we've been able to load up on, on Tommy, the left-handed kid. We've also been able to rem load up on Ramon Hernandez, who's their middle, and neutralize those guys. And David, because once again, because they don't pa they haven't passed the ball real well, David kind of swings away and makes a, a number of errors. And every once in a while we get to stick him on the block. And, and they really, uh, I don't see them playing real strongly as a unit uh, right now. But I also feel that the tournament, the EIV tournament, is at, Penn State 
and Rutgers beat them uh, last week in five at Penn State, and I still believe that Penn State will 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 beat Rutgers uh, at Penn at Penn State for the uh, bid. Okay, We've got just a couple minutes left. Let's talk about the Patriots. Uh, any surprises with that team, or we just kind of outclassed them? A lot of people were there say that they really are overrated, even at uh, what 15 or 16 in the nation. They didn't feel like they were playing very well at all. As, I mean, we didn't know a lot about them last week. We know a little bit more about them now. Are they really having problems? Yeah, they're sort of struggling. And they're struggling uh, for a, a couple reasons. Uh, one is it appears that they just don't have a lot of unity. You know, as I watch them play, uh, they, they, they are fragmenting, uh, individually fragmenting. Scott Metcalf, who is their real strong, big middle hitter, yeah, you can tell that he's, he's pushing really hard to try and make the team follow, and the team's just not following. Follow. And so when they're not following, he gets more frustrated. He gets yelling and screaming. And when he does, the other guys just really kind of turn him off. The other thing, because they have some kids that have some ability. I'm, I'm impressed with some of their physical abilities. But the other thing is the same problem that Penn State's having is they, they're just not able to pass the ball. Jason Robertson, once again, who's a left-handed kid, who's a real dynamic player for them. We watched them play against Ball State. I mean, he came from everywhere. He's only about 6'2", but he came from everywhere. I mean, he's just like a wild banshee. You know, and he's uh, swinging from the middle of the backcourt, left side, right side, just wailing away. He really never was much of a factor against us. Uh, uh, we blocked him a couple times, and, and then we tried to serve him and neutralize him a little bit as far as their offensive movement was concerned. And uh, the more pressure we put on them, the more errors they made. And uh, that just seems to be where they're at right now. Well, we uh, certainly look forward to seeing the Volley Dons in action again this weekend at our place, final match for the seniors. Uh, at home and final chance for the fans to see the, the Volley Dons at home with the uh, Ball State Cardinals coming in here. And uh, we'll talk to the seniors next week about uh, the results of this match. This match means the uh, first and uh, first seed in the MIBA, and that's what we're all shooting for. Good luck this week, Coach. Um, I guess we'll root for Ohio State on Wednesday down at Ball State, or uh, we'll just take care of ourselves on Saturday. Well, thanks, Jim. Well, Greg, make sure you get there early because you may not get a seat if you don't get there early. Thanks a lot, Coach. Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. I'm Jim Orr. I'm your host. And this week, uh, we are proud to have with us Juan Ortiz and Neil Day, both seniors on the Volley Dons. Gentlemen, I want to welcome you first to Arnie Ball Show. It's a uh, welcome change. Uh, good to have a conversation with you for a change. Thank you. The, um, Great to be here. I want to start off with first this week is we want to talk a little bit about uh, volleyball and how you got involved in, in the sport. Um, Having come from a state myself, uh, Ohio, where they don't have men's volleyball or haven't had men's volleyball, how did you get started with it? Uh, Juan, let's start with you. Okay, I started um, basically in, in, in grade school, like in gym class. Then I went to high school. I started playing in teams, like in eighth grade. I'll play all the way 
through, through 12th grade, like my senior high school. And then I, I, didn't, I didn't play with, in, in my first year of college. Um, that was it. I mean, then I came here after that. Okay. Neil, what about you? How did you get started? Um, well, my brother played. Uh, he played basketball, and then he played um, volleyball in, during the volleyball season. And I went and watched him play, and it looked like a lot of fun. So when I played basketball off season, I thought I'd try it to stay in shape. And then I fell in love with it my freshman year. Went on, and I made uh, Junior Olympics in uh, Keystone State Games for Pennsylvania and got some higher-level coaching and made all state my junior and senior years and went on East Stroudsburg and then from there I came here. Now men's volleyball won, you said uh, it's very big in, in yeah. Puerto Rico. Is it, do they have like leagues that they have to play yeah. in or how does it work down there? We have leagues in I mean, high school, like I said before, and then we have a, we have a, we have a pro league. We have teams all on the island, like towns. And then also we, we're, then Sand, then sand Beach, I mean the, and then the beach is getting pretty big now. With all the, with the, all the tours that like now they have, I know last weekend there were the, with the women's tour in Puerto Rico, a big tournament in Puerto Rico. So, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty big. Are you the only one in your family who plays? Right now, yes, yes I am. Neil, what about uh, what about yourself uh, with with club ball and things like that? Did you get an opportunity to play club or was it just high school ball or? Uh, yeah, I played both. Like I said, I had made um, Willow Pond was my junior Olympic team, and I got to play in a few tournaments around the country with them. Um, I played on the Keystone State Games team and a couple of, you know, traveling teams we have out of Pittsburgh that were kind of like, I guess you could say, all-star teams, um, and playing in high school. Now, high school ball in Pennsylvania is a pretty, pretty hot item, isn't it? Yeah, where I'm at, it's like... It's a real hotbed for volleyball around the country. Um, I don't know, this might be my opinion, I might be a little bit biased, but next to Southern California, I think Western Pennsylvania High School is the best high school volleyball in the country outside of Southern California. Well, not in Puerto Rico. Well, outside of Puerto Rico. I don't know, we'll see about <laughs> Maybe we'll get an all-star game going sometime. Okay. Juan, how did you get here? I mean, obviously you came up the interstate, but other than that, I mean, you ended up uh, your first year of school. You're in, at Xavier. Xavier, yeah, yeah, in Cincinnati. I was there with my brother. And then there was no men's team. It was only a women's team, uh, Division One. Then I went to, for, to the practices and I, I could become in front of, of the coach. Then I asked him, like, you can start start a club team. So we started a club team. We, we gather four guys from Puerto Rico, two guys from the states, and one guy from Japan, I think. And we started playing a couple of games. Then one game, I told, I asked him if I could play in a, like, a, like in a higher level, like in college. And they go, so, yes, I think so. So he called Arnie Ball, and he came down for one match. And after that, he just, that's it. I just came here. He just, your your major is business um, business in supervision. Okay, Neil, you had a uh, well-traveled career also. <laughs> Starting out, obviously, out in Western Pennsylvania, you uh, started out playing at East Strasburg? Yeah, when I was um, actually in high school, I was all set to go play basketball at Edinburgh University after my senior year in basketball. And they had a really good Division II ball club there. Um, but my senior year at the state championships, um, I played really well. And then I had happened to run into Coach Sweeney, who was the coach at East Strasburg. Mm -hmm. He told me, I really want to play volleyball. I had thought about going to George Mason, but the financial opportunity wasn't there like it was at Edinburgh for basketball. So um, I, uh, but when Sweeney was able to, um, I got an academic scholarship to East Stroudsburg for academics. So I was able to go there and play volleyball and basketball and have an academic scholarship. So I went there and played, didn't play basketball, just played volleyball. And my first year was good. My second year we had some guys quit the team and some problems with the team. We had started to go a little bit downhill. We weren't like peaking, going up. Um, so I wanted to play <coughs> at a higher level, have a chance to win the national championship. I love my coach and everything, but I knew I had seen Coach, we had played against Coach Ball when I was a freshman. I saw him play when I was a sophomore, win a match at, at Rutgers against Penn State. It was just an awesome match, and I thought he did a great job with the team. I thought the team was a great team, and I well, seemed like I would want to be a part of it. That year at the Olympic Festival tryouts, he was running them, and... He saw me play. I mentioned to him I was interested in transferring. I got my release to talk to him as a coach. 
He says he was interested in having me, so I came here. The uh, <clears throat> changes in the uh, sport from Puerto Rico to the United States won. Um, what about the style of play? They, was it a different uh, ball game down there in, in Puerto Rico? I mean, the nets and everything else is all the same, but what about style of play? Uh, Puerto Rico, basically, I mean, they have like, they have like two setters playing at the same time, so they're still running, still running a 6-2 offense uh, with, with everyone hitting the ball. Um, mainly, the, the guys in the, in the back row, <coughs> I, I, I were passing the ball, so if I get front row, I don't have to pass. So they're, um, I think, a little I mean, behind. But, I mean, they're getting advantage because a lot of people from Puerto Rico are playing in the States, like in Penn State here, and a couple of people in the West Coast. So, and, and, then, and, then, and then when they go back to Puerto Rico, they're implementing the things they learned. And so they're making the game better, I mean, at okay. a uh, higher level. What about uh, with the East Coast, Neil? Um, having played at Strasburg and played against most of the teams out there in the uh, EIVA, what about the style of play? Is it, uh, obviously, we see a lot of these pe people coming in here, but is there uh, a difference for us? The style of play, before I got here, I think it would have been similar in that the styles of play were similar. The fan support here is a lot stronger, especially here at IPFW. It's the best in the country. But um, the style of play has now changed. I think we're a slightly a step above the East Coast. Not a whole lot, but well, not Penn State. I th Penn State's program, maybe Rutgers, and our program here at IPFW is more suited to a West Coast style of play, or more intense than some of the other programs out there. But the basic concepts behind the playing, not like Puerto Rico where their concepts are a little bit different. Um, the concepts are the same, pretty much, between East Coast and Midwest. You both have had a great deal of opportunity to be exposed to the sport on a variety of different levels. Since you've been here at IPFW, um, what kind of changes have you seen within the team that have taken us from uh, one step maybe to uh, a different step as far as uh, quality of play and so forth? Any changes? Mm, I think players have become I mean, a lot better. But, I mean, I've been here for years and the freshmen were coming in. I had really good players. I mean, not like I mean, my, not like my my freshman year. Freshman year, there were I mean some people who needed more work, like uh, one year or two years to get a lot better. Now freshmen, like, I mean, are like much, I mean higher level. Like you can say, uh, Greg Collins. I mean, he's a good example of that. I mean, he he he's going to be a good player in one more year. I mean, good player. And you got a uh, mm, guy from Puerto Rico, Felipe Rallat. I mean, this guy, I mean, playing since, I know, high school and more. I mean, he played in, like, in other parts of the countries. It's kind of scary, almost, that you think about our team. We're really young. I mean, Juan, Tom, and Mike are seniors. But the other guys, um, they're just they're freshmen and sophomores, and they're really, really good. Mm -hmm. And we have 17 guys, not just the 12 that usually dress for matches. We have 17 quality players on this team that are really you know, capable of playing almost any any team around the country. Many of them, I think the guys on our, that you would call our bench, depending on who starts, um, could very easily start for most of the top 20 teams around the country. There, We have a really solid team. There's a lot of depth. And I can remember when we played IPFW when I was a freshman at East Stroudsburg, um, the team didn't have that kind of depth that it does now. The, uh, the coaching styles, uh, How's that changed with uh, for the last couple of years uh, with Coach Ball? Any changes or? I think I've changed a little bit because I mean, like Neil said, now we have more depth in the team, so so I, in that way he can put some people on the bench. Like if like people are playing are playing bad or like who are tired, he can bring some people on the bench and like and then and, and rise the level of the team playing this year with Felipe in the middle, um, with with, with Quinton Spiro too. I mean, there are a lot of people who can come to the bench and, and aggress the level. So, in that that way, yeah, I think he's changed a little bit. When we were at Penn State. He played everyone in key roles. Everyone played at, in, in the Penn State tournament. That was a weekend where we played. I think it was six matches, mm -hmm. six or seven yeah. matches, yeah. all in two days. And everyone played in key points, and everyone played really well, and just showed the depth of our team. And he 
can become more of, I guess, a chess player, you could say, where, you know, he can counter other coaches, which he's really good at, you know, with moves. He can change the ga the flow of the game with substitutions. Um, he can just do a lot more with that depth. Also, I think he's he's gone a little bit easier on us this year with practice. <laughs> careful, careful. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that it was, no, he was perfectly reasonable always, but before, but I've only been here two years, so you'd have to ask him about the years before that. But this year with practice, it's been, we he's given us more days off and time to rest, because we have more players. Um, we're all in much better physical shape and mental shape right now. I believe in the season we were, and that's he was really good with that last year. I think that was another reason why we were so strong at the end of the season. I remember at East Stroudsburg, we uh, pushed it a lot, you know, where we didn't get as much rest sometimes. But that we were still good there also. Yeah, the end, at the end of the year, you're losing some legs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Keep going that hard. Well, gentlemen, we're going to uh, take a break, and when we get back. We'll be talking about volleyball 101. And normally, this is where Arnie does his thing as far as giving us all kinds of insight. He's lost his tenured position, so now I've come to you people to get inside your brains a little bit. We'll talk uh, what it takes, what you're looking for as a, as a player. Uh, but right now we're going to take uh, just a short break, and we'll be back with you after Alan Bangs and Sports Break. Here's the Channel 6 Sports Minute. I'm Alan Bangs. Top-seeded IPFW will face the fourth-seeded University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in the opening round of the Midwest Intercollegiate Volleyball Association Tournament this Friday in Columbus, Ohio. The Volleydons clinched the top seed of the tournament when they defeated conference rival Ball State 17-15, 15-3, and 16-14 in their final regular season match last Friday. IPFW was undefeated in conference play this year. Quinton Spiegel led the Volleydon attack with 21 kills against Ball State. Norman Almodovar added 12. Loy Ball had a great day with 45 assists, 9 kills, 6 blocks, and 3 aces. Friday's win against Ball State gave Coach Arnie Ball his third regular season MEVA championship in a row. If IPFW should win the MEVA postseason tournament, they will head to the NCAA championships in Muncie, Indiana. Should IPFW defeat Wisconsin-Milwaukee on Friday, they will play either Ball State or host Ohio State in, in Saturday's championship match. No matter what the outcome of the rest of the season is, the 1991-92 campaign was the best ever for the seventh-ranked Volleydons. This season, they posted school records for most victories and best winning percentage. The IPFW tennis team continues to hold on to a winning record. Last week, they scored wins against Tri-State and Southern Indiana while losing to St. Joseph's and Grand Valley State. With two matches left in the season, the Mastodons are 7-5 and five overall, 4-4 four and four in the Great Lakes Valley Conference. Although it was freezing cold today, Channel 6 was out at the IPFW baseball field recording the Mastodons taking on crosstown rival Indiana Tech. Indiana Tech hammered Coach Carl Wilcoxon's Mastodons in a 12-5 Warrior victory. For Channel 6 Sports, I'm Alan Banks. Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show, and I'd like to welcome our guests again, Juan Ortiz and Neil, Neil Day. Uh, we are going to start this segment with Volleyball 101. Gentlemen, we're going to get inside your minds a little bit. Um, a lot of volleyball is mind games. Neil, let's start with you and talk about what it takes mentally as, as a blocker. What are, you, what are you thinking as you uh, get involved in, in blocking and your premier blocker in the nation? Let's, let's Get inside your mind here a little bit. Well, one thing I believe every time the ball served, I'm going to block every ball. You have to believe that I want to block anything and everything, no matter where's the ball, where, where the ball is set. Um, what I do is I watch the pass um, to see where it's going to go, whether it pulls a setter off the net, because if he's off the net, it limits his options to where he can set the ball. And then, and then I watch him, and I watch my man, whoever the middle attacker is out of the corner of my eye, and I'm watching the setter to see where he's going to set the ball. When he sets the ball, I just bust my hardest to get to where he sets the ball, and I get myself under control as quickly as possible and go up 
penetrate over net and try to block the ball. Um, when I do block balls, it's the best feeling in the game. It's better than anything else for me. I've seen very few people that really enjoy the block as much as you do. <laughs> it's a great attitude. Um, Juan, let's talk a little bit about uh, about defense. For Neil, he said a lot of it is is attitude as far as he's concerned and mm -hmm. setting the block and deciding he's going to block every ball. What about defense? I mean, when you come in the game, you're going to be serving. You're there to make the defensive plays. Yes. What does it take to be a defensive player, a good defensive player? Well, a good defensive player needs to be, needs to be in the right place at the right moment. Um, so, I mean, so and we start in like in base defense, so, so we know we're supposed to start, and then from there we go. Depends on the, the setter. Like, like depends on where the ball sets. It says outside. Well, then we just move aside. But also, you also need to watch the blockers. The blocker, because it is a hole in the block, then you have to fill the hole in the block. So also, so basically, I mean, you have to be, I mean, 100% alert of what's going on in the game. Um, basically, what's going in front of you, because I mean, if the ball goes off the block, then you have to react. It's one. And I can split, split a second and just move and just go hard and they'll get the ball. Uh, so that's one of the things that, that I look like that I look in the game. Also when I'm in the bench, I tend to look what the other players do when they're hitting the ball. If they tend to like to tip the ball or the block or they tend to hit high against the hands or hit or hit the hole like we call the seam in, in, in our block. So I tend to Look at that. So then, when I go in the, in the game, I know what 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 will be their percentage. We oh. had <clears throat> a couple of other subjects I want to talk about, but you brought up a subject I'd rather talk about. Um, coming in off the bench. Now, both of you have come in off the bench this year. Um, what are you doing when you're on the sideline? You just standing there, kind of you know, communing with the crowd, or you know, giving each other high fives, getting some water. What are you doing when you're on the bench? I mean, not everybody can play. Not mm -hmm. everybody can start. So, what are you doing to? To keep yourself in the game. Well, sometimes I mean, sometimes we sometimes we talk around that, and, and but most of the time we're looking at the game. I'm trying to cheer the players who are playing up, so 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 then we can win the game, the match. But then at the same time we also look. I mean, I'm looking at what the other players do and where our fault are, because at the, because sometimes I help Lloyd setting wise, in, 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 like in, like in the setting setting position, then like telling where. Where our players are hitting the ball, or like, it, or it decides too low or too high, or I mean, or or that kind of stuff, setting wise, or also like different wise too. Okay, I usually, Neil? I usually, um, if coach takes me out, you know, he usually has a specific reason, something he wants me to look at, you know, and see for when he puts me back in. I uh, often I'll rest myself to get myself prepared to go. I try and get myself mentally prepared thinking about what I'm going to do when I do go back in. I will watch the other team and see what they're doing, what the other middle is doing, what kind of plays they're running, so I can be better prepared when I go back in there to get in front of their attackers. Um, and I like to cheer the guys who are out there <laughs> on, you know, and that's what we all do. The, the bench player's role in volleyball is, could be, I mean, I don't know, it's another biased opinion, but it could be the most important role of, of bench player in any sport because there's so much to it. There's cheering. You're almost like the crowd. Because whenever I know when I'm playing and I get a big play, I turn to my teammates on the court and I immediately turn to my teammates on the bench because they really get me fired up. And also, they're always giving you feedback on what is going on because you can't always see everything out there on the court. Mm -hmm. And they see things that you don't. And when, you know, their timeouts and everything, you know, they'll come to you and say, you know, this, this is happening, so-and-so is doing this. And it really helps you to be better prepared when you go back, when you go back out there. It's great to have the quality of players we have on our team. Physically, they're certainly very, very capable of playing at, at a high level. But they also are knowledgeable, so that they can give you the, mm -hmm. the additional insight. And you can hear what they're they're actually saying when yeah. they're out there. Sure. Yeah. You, I try and focus in on what I'm doing, but <clears throat> you know they'll say something specifically, like a short sentence, like you know, um, watch watch the backslide or watch the 31, something like that, and you can hear that quickly and you can focus back in on what you're doing. So, yes, you, you do hear what they're saying when they're telling us things. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll have you two back later on. We'll cover the other two things I wanted to talk about, but uh, let's move on right now, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming MIVAs. Um, 
first match we have is uh, against the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Uh, uh, we don't want to look past anybody, but let's be honest, it's it's not going to be. Uh, um, it better not be a world class <laughs> match. Okay. No. Um, the second match of the first night, of, of course, is going to be then Ball State and Ohio State. Neil, who do you see coming out of that? I see Ball State coming out of it because. One, they've beaten Ohio State twice this year, and they've beaten Ohio State on, on Ohio State's court in five games. Now, Ohio State was missing a key player when that happened, Mike Terpstra, who's their, probably their best hitter. But I know Coach Shondell. I also know Coach Hanson, but I think that Coach Shondell is going to have his team ready. They want another shot at us, <laughs> and they are going to be really fired up to beat Ohio State. And I think that they're slightly a better team than Ohio State right now. But Ohio State could rise up and play better than them. So anything's possible. I think okay. Juan, what do you think? I think Ohio State is going to win. I mean, they're playing. At the, I mean, at home with a crowd. Um, well, sort of a crowd. Sort of a crowd. I mean, probably. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> How many people will be there? I mean, it's that big, big place. Big place so it'd be hard to fill that up. It's nothing like our crowd. But I think because in the past game they're playing at Ball State, when they play at Ohio State, I think. They lost in like in five games, but I heard. I mean, they're winning, and like Neil said, the best hitter got hurt. And then when they played Ball State, they were winning all three games, but they lost. So I think, I think they'll get their act together, and and, be, and the coach Hanson will get the team fired up for that game. Um, speaking of crowds, what kind of impact is it going to be over there uh, at St. John's? I mean, we played over there what last week, uh, week before last, and it was. It's a huge barn. Um, you know, you put four or five hundred people in there, and it, you don't even know they're there. Yeah. What's What's the difference between playing in St. John's and playing at home? That's for us. Um, there's nothing like playing here. I mean, you can't compare any place like playing here because our fans are. I mean, just anybody who's been at the game, they can just sense it. Like you know, what our fans are like here. Our fans mm -hmm. are the loudest, the most supportive in the country. Mm -hmm of us. Mm -hmm. um, at St. John it's so big and the thing is I think we're going to have a lot of fans there because a lot of people, we have a lot of support here and they're going to go down there. Mm -hmm. So we could have just as many fans as some of the other teams down there. We did at Ball State for the MIVAs last mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. So I think fan and crowd support will be at least, will be at least equal with Ohio State down there because our fans are so supportive of us. Juan, how much do you guys feed off of this? The fans here. Oh, a lot. I mean, when you're playing, I mean, like, <clears throat> and like, let's say you lo we're losing or the game's tight, and this fans start like, clapping and start cheering up. I mean, it's like, just like basically just picks you up, and, and and then you want to play better for the fan and for yourself, because I mean, they're here for one thing, but they're th they're there to they're there to cheer you up and to watch you win. So you have to play better. I mean, you have to at least try better. Okay. That's, that's okay. What you say, I mean, try the hardest you can try. I mean, instead of instead of uh, giving all you got, you're giving more you got. I mean, the rest, because yeah. it's for the it's for the championship. Well, we know uh, obviously who Ohio State or Ball State is going to be playing in the finals, and um, we have a pretty good indication of uh, where we feel we'll be in uh, another week and a half. Um, let's go quickly then out to the uh, the West Coast. Uh, okay, Mr. Favorites, uh, <laughs> who you picking? Uh, Stanford is the team that I think will be well, Long Beach naturally because people they're in a good position they're number one in the country right now and they're in a good position to make it to the final four even if they weren't to win they would get in that large bid so they're pretty much a shoe in to get in right now um, Stanford uh, my doubles partner and one of my best friends <laughs> is a middle blocker for Stanford and uh, I think they're really good I've seen them play on TV I've seen tapes he showed me during the summer. You know, he's, I'm constantly updated about their team because I talked to him on the phone. You know, so I know that they have a quality team, and they have a quality setter, like we do, and they're in a very good position to go to the Final Four. And there's a good possibility that we'll play them in the first round if we were the win and they were the win, like according to predictions. Okay. And I think that'd be really nice. One, you got one minute. Tell me who you got. Well. Like Long Beach, I mean, they'll be there. Um, and the rest, I mean, I don't know. Because, I mean, West Coast are so good teams. We have Stanford, we have uh, Pepperdine. Pepperdine, we North have Ridge. North Ridge, Santa Barbara. UCLA, Santa Barbara. I mean, we have so many teams. A base, base would be Long Beach would be there. 
but that'd be the first team. And the rest, I mean, who knows? Probably be a team who's playing good. I mean, they're having like a good, I mean, hot streak and whatever. But I think Long Beach will be there, and I have got to go with Stanford because they've, they've been ranked up there every time for the past weeks. So. Okay, real quickly, East Coast, one team. Just tell oh, me who it is. Penn State. Penn State. Even though Rutgers has had them all year long, you got Penn State. Penn State. Penn State. Well, we know why you picked Penn State. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they're going to come through at the end. I think Rutgers is a solid team, but I think Penn State's going to, the nature of their program, I think that they're going to come through in the end. But don't count Rutgers and don't count George Mason out. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, both of them could win. Penn, that, the East is the most up for grab division where there isn't a clear favorite. But I think Penn State will win also. National championships, guys. What do you think? Well, the final match would be Long Beach against us. I think we have a good chance to win that. IP Neil? IPFW, I'm a senior. It has to be. All right. <laughs> Definitely. Well, gentlemen, we certainly want to thank you for, uh, for giving up so much of your time today. We really appreciate having the conversation with you. It's been great watching your careers. And uh, I know I, I appreciate just being able to watch good volleyball, and you guys have done a wonderful job. Um, look forward to seeing you this weekend. Another MIBA championship trophy for us. And mm -hmm. uh, on to Muncie and uh, kick some butt down there, I guess, eh? Yep. Thank God Thanks a lot, gentlemen. And Thank we'll be you. back with you next week again for the Arnie Ball Show. Thank you. Welcome to the Arnie Ball Show. I'm Jim Orr, your host. With us this week, our special guest, Blake Sabring of the News Sentinel. First time, I think, that we've ever introduced you to anybody. I've gotten that right. I <laughs> um, want to thank you for being with us today, Blake. We're going to be uh, spending some time, you and I and Coach, talking about volleyball. Surprise, surprise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Big deal. First of all, Coach, I want to congratulate you on the, uh, the MIBA championship and the invitation to the Final Four. That was uh, a great final match. Any comments on the uh, the match itself? And then Blake's going to jump in, I'm sure, with a few Well, comments. Jim, <laughs> yeah, I, I have a couple comments. First of all, thank you very much for uh, being kind in regards to our selection. I want you to know that the reason that happened, <laughs> there's a specific reason why that happened, <laughs> and it's because Greg's mother got mad at me because I pick on Greg all the time, and I took all of my frustrations and energies out on the team <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, we play very well. So it all goes back to Greg's mom. So I want to say a great big thank you here publicly to Greg's mom for getting upset because I pick on Greg all the time on this show. So thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> so what about Ohio State? Uh, uh, the final match, I didn't get to see the semifinals. I, I kind of went the way I expected it to with Ohio State coming out of there. Um, I felt Coach Hanson was going to be able to pull out 
won great match, and did Ohio State really overextend themselves and kind of shoot it all at one time, or were they pretty much as you expected on Saturday night? Well, we'll go back to the semifinals uh, very briefly. You know, I'm so far I'm on a roll. I picked Penn State to beat Rutgers, and they did. <laughs> and, and, I, and I won the bet with Lisa Sheehan in regards to Ohio State and Ball State. And then, of course, I picked us to win. So I'm kind of on a roll here right right now. And and I think that uh, part of what happened on Friday night was that Ball State uh, looked a little past Ohio State uh, and, and shouldn't have done so. Um, I mean, they had split uh, during the year in four matches they had played. And Ohio State had uh, lost to Ball State at their place, but Terpster didn't play their best player. And it went five games. And I just felt that Ohio State would uh, would would have an opportunity to beat them, and, and certainly that happened on Friday night. And it was a tough match. I mean, it was a five-gamer. I think it was 16-14 in the fifth game, and, and Ohio State's behind 14-12, to 12, you know, and, and probably should have lost. It was a real physical game for both teams. I know a couple of Ohio State players talked to my kids before we played and said they were really tired and sore after playing on, on Friday night. So I think emotionally uh, and physically somewhat they were a little drained, but to tell you what, they came out and played really hard on Saturday night, and... Pete has nothing to be ashamed of in regards to the way those kids played. They played really hard. Uh, we were just a better team, I thought, Saturday night. What do you think about the uh, the match Saturday night, Blake, as, as far as how we played, maybe opposed to the last time we played Ball State here at home? Sure. I thought maybe that uh, that Ohio State would be really fired up, and they I, they were, but it was never even close. The IPFW was just, they could tell that they were more fired up that match than I think I've seen them in a couple months. They were ready to play, and they just took over right from the start. They did everything well. One of the things I think that I, I saw Saturday night that I hadn't seen previously, I think, Coach, we uh, talked about this a little bit Monday. Um, for lack of a better term, it seemed like IPFW was playing with somewhat reckless abandon. They were just flat out doing things, uh, a lot of good things we hadn't seen them do previously. Uh, we talked about playing defense being one of them, making some great defensive plays. Whole tone, if you go back and look at the tape, of the game, the whole tone of the match got started right away. Uh, Tom Junkie served for us first, and within about four successive rallies, stood in the middle of the backcourt where you're supposed to stand and dug balls and covered balls and just played like a man possessed on defense. He did. Really set the tone for the rest of our players, I thought, for the rest of the evening in regards to backcourt defense, and certainly your comments are correct. I mean, uh, Lloyd dug four very, very difficult balls perfectly on target. Lloyd hasn't dug that many tip balls perfectly on target in his whole <laughs> career, let alone in one match. Uh, and then Pepe Rolot runs two or three balls down. Craig Collin runs a ball down that, that uh, no one in, with any na uh, uh, abilities like what we have could even come close to running down. And Neil plays like crazy in the back row and Raul. And, I just really th felt that when Tommy came out and done, did those things correctly in the backcourt, it set a tone for our kids in the, in the way we play defense and the attitude towards the way we play defense. Blake, let's talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming uh, Final Four. Um, we're there as we expected to be. A um, couple teams, obviously, that uh, should be there aren't there. Um, I think uh, Ray Rattel from Long Beach was uh, spoke in the... Uh, uh, USA Today saying that there were five teams that he felt legitimately could win the uh, the national championship. Uh, I think he expected his Long Beach State to be one of them. They're not there. Um, but let's go out east first. Um, Rutgers and Newark. A surprise for you? Um, not really. Penn State was playing at home. Penn State's bigger. I think Penn State might have a better offense than than Rutgers does. Rutgers has a better defense. But playing at home in a big tournament, and Penn State has the experience of winning that tournament year after year after year, it, it had to be a great advantage. Well, we've talked about the selection process too, Coach, and here's a situation where um, Rutgers comes in here with a 21 victory each season. Uh, Penn State is, what, 16 and 12 or something like that. How much now is the selection committee looking at name recognition as opposed to uh, the type of teams they've played? It did. Penn State play that strong a schedule that they they're going to get in with the 16 wins as opposed to Rutgers with 21 or well really the only team that they they would have consistently lost to would have been Rutgers that wasn't ranked above them you know all year obviously we beat them three times I think or four 
and we've been ranked above them all year. They lost twice to Pepperdine, uh, or Stanford, I guess it was, Stanford. Pepperdine also. And Pepperdine too, right? Uh, so, I mean, they've played some good teams. Uh, I don't know, was UCLA out there this year too? No, last year. Last year. Uh, but so they've lost some good teams. Uh, I don't necessarily think that, I mean, I hope that the NCAA committee's not looking at name recognition. If they are, they have to kind of wonder what an IPFA is doing there, you know, as compared <laughs> to a Penn State and, and all those other guys. Uh, but uh, I think Penn State legitimately, the winner of that tournament, would have been the legitimate representative from the East. Okay. Uh, let's go out West. Uh, start with Pepperdine. Well, Pepperdine, I think, got a break by playing Long Beach the way they did in the first first round. Long Beach had just lost to UCLA and they were down and I think from what I understand talking to some people on the West Coast Long Beach looked just like USC did at the end of last year. They had been number one the whole year and they were just worn down by it and it got to them and Brett Hilliard was had a horrible match. He had 22 kills in like 17 attempts. Just horrible for him. And then I think that's what hurt Long Beach again in the next match because they just didn't have the, the energy left to come back. Does the number one ranking weigh that much on uh, on a team throughout the years? Is You're it, asking me that question? Yeah, yeah. I've never been number one. How number would 10. I know? How do I answer that? Sure you have. Huh? Mean, you've ranked uh, number one in the MIVA. Let's pretend, uh, let's pretend you're ranked number one in the NCAA. Or, or, I mean, you're, you're pretty close uh, with uh, Coach McLaughlin. How much does that weigh upon the guys? Tough. It's tough. Uh, you know, a good friend of ours down to the south, down in Bloomington, talks about the fact that the higher you climb, the more your backside gets exposed. Think about that for a second. <laughs> uh, you got every every dog in the country that's wanting to take a shot at you, and they're all preparing real hard to take a shot at you, and you're just preparing real hard to survive, period, when you look at those rankings. And, and I don't know that they really mean a whole lot, obviously. This, they've not meant a whole lot in this tournament the last couple of years because the number one seed's always gotten beat or, or the higher ranked team's gotten beat. Uh, but I think it does take a toll on you. And, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, we were talking before we went on the show about rankings and how important they are or aren't, aren't important. Well, media thinks they're important. Fans think they're important. They are. They are important for, for those those people because that gives you some bragging rights, gives you something to think about. So the, Media's always wanting to talk to the number one team in the country. You're always the number one team in the country. It's just that added uh, distraction that you always have that, that when you're number one, and, and obviously everybody's taking a shot at you. Uh, we've, we felt that uh, the last two weeks here in the MIVA uh, with uh, going, having to go to Ohio State and, and playing Ball State here at home, and then having to go back and play in that tournament, knowing you're the number one seed, knowing you're supposed to win, and knowing that all three of those teams, I mean, there's Wisconsin, Milwaukee playing us on Friday night. They're playing all world. Dan Snopko, who's you know a former player of ours, holy cow! I've never seen him play like that in his <laughs> life. He's named the All Tournament team, and rightfully so, because hey, we're going to play IPFW. They're ranked number one. Here's our chance, you know. And so it it it, it is an added pressure. It is an added burden. Uh, but I prefer being there as being down below. Do you like the situation that? Uh Pepperdine's in as far as number four. Um, They're seated first, was, right? They were seated first. From what I understand, the reason they were seated first was that the committee, they won one of the two divisions out there, Long Beach won the other one. And the committee did not think they could seed them number two behind Stanford, which did not win a division because Pepperdine won a division. The two teams split during the year. Both matches went five games. Both matches were at Pepperdine. Stanford won the last match of the year at Pepperdine. It's just, you could flip a coin. It really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Does it make a lot of difference to you, Coach? Heck no. We're just, <laughs> we're just glad to be going to the dance. We don't care who we play. You got, you got, to, you got to play everybody at some time or another anyhow. Uh, actually, it's probably a little bit of an advantage for us to play Stanford, maybe, just because I know a lot of the kids. You know, I've spent time with Canyon Seaman, Duncan Blackman, uh, Besmelik, uh, let's see, uh, not Goss, but um, Moose, uh, Hillman. I mean, all those kids I've coached at some time. I know all those kids really well. And what they do, uh, when you take a look at Pepperdine, uh, Sorensen and Dwayne Cameron, I guess, are really the only two kids that I know much about or that we've played, uh, coached or played against. So maybe an advantage for us to play Stanford. Uh, we really don't care. We're just going to go play. How do we match up against Stanford personnel-wise? Well, physically, we're about the same uh, as far as height and 
we may be a little heavier than they are, I don't know, but uh, physically we're about, physically we're real similar. The offensive patterns, uh, they, at least from what we can ascertain, because we haven't played them, they are a little more conservative than what we are. We're, we're a little more radical in offensive philosophy. But the big systems surprise. and the patterns, <laughs> yeah, no big surprise, right? The systems and the patterns are identical. I mean, if you look at their team and you look at their serve reception patterns, they're just they're positively identical. Easy for us to practice this week because we know exactly what they're going to do. Uh, of course, they know exactly what we're going to do, too. Uh, so, so from that standpoint, we're real identical. Uh, Raul, who is our number two swing, is more, much more active than their number two swing, either Hillman or Moose. Uh, of course, Blackman, who would be comparable to Norman in, in our system, is pretty much a left side hitter. We'll do some kind of movement, but he's pretty much a left side hitter, about 6'4", same, same as Norman. He's not as physical as Norman, but really sticks the ball. Uh, the two middles are probably, now if we played Pepe and Norman, or excuse me, Pepe and Neil, we're pretty much the same. They're more broad shouldered than we are, about the same size. Matter of fact, Pepe's probably a little bigger than what their middles are. Uh, the, the, the major discrepancy in the two teams is, is the opposite because of Goss. Dave Goss, who set an NCAA record you know, in kills against UCLA back earlier in the year, is real force. And he's pretty much a left side attacker and a back row attacker. Uh, they don't very often swing him to the right. He almost always goes left. Unlike our situation where Quentin and Craig have been playing in there, and we use them a lot in, in our quick attack. We use them a lot in the blues. We use them a lot on combos. Uh, so that's where the discrepancy comes, and that's where they probably have the experience and the advantage over us if indeed there is an advantage. Blake, the, uh, the, the Stanford team, you've had an opportunity to talk to Loy a little bit, and you're going to be talking to uh, some of the people out on the West Coast. Any insights on their part as to how they feel like they match up against with us? No, I haven't gotten a chance to get that deep into it. They're, they're pretty much just happy to uh, to be there because they, 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 I think they thought that they would have a lot more trouble than they did because they were behind Long Beach in their pool and they had to win three tough matches to come back, and so they might be a little bit tired coming in Friday after traveling. Also, you look at their statistics and the t statistics are almost equal. I mean, they all six of their starters hit over 30 percent. Same thing for IPFW. It's just real, real similar statistically. Well, we'll take a uh, bit of a break, uh, let you guys catch your breath, and we'll uh, stop now and have Alan Bangs with sports break, and then we'll get back and talk some more volleyball. Here's a Channel 6 Sports Minute. I'm Alan Bangs. Two more victories and a national championship will come home to Fort Wayne. The IPFW men's volleyball team earned an invitation to the NCAA Big Dance when they beat Ohio State in the championship match of the Midwest Intercollegiate Volleyball Association Tournament in Columbus, Ohio last Saturday. Coach Arnie Ball's Volley Dons make the short trip down I-69 to Ball State University in Muncie this Friday for the first round of tournament action. A victory Friday puts the Volley Dons in the championship game at Ball State on Saturday night. The Volley Dons are seated third in the tournament. Friday night, they'll take on number two seed Stanford at 7.30 at Ball State's Arena. This will be the first meeting ever between IPFW and the 23-3 Stanford Cardinals. Stanford is ranked second in both the Tachikara Coaches Poll and the latest Volleyball Monthly Magazine Poll. IPFW is ranked seventh in both polls. Should IPFW make it to the 7.30 p.m. championship match on Saturday, their opponent will be either number one seeded Pepperdine or number four seed Penn State. The 22-4 Pepperdine Wave are ranked number three in national polls. IPFW has met Pepperdine only once before. Back in 1989, the Wave beat IPFW in three games. The Penn State Nittany Lions hold a record of 16-12 and, and lead the series against IPFW 11-5. The Volley Dons have, however, defeated Penn State five out of their last six meetings. In fact, they have beaten them three times this season. Penn State is ranked 11th in the latest Tachikara Coaches Poll. The Volley Dons will play in a 5 p.m. consolation match on Saturday should they lose Friday night's match. After this season, most would agree that IPFW has become the dominant team in the Midwest. IPFW has won three straight MEVA regular season titles and two straight tournament crowns. The Volley Dons have even made a mark on West Coast competition, going 8-4 and four against California teams. That's the best any team from the Midwest or East has ever done against Western competition. And that's a look at sports. I'm Alan Banks. Now back to the show. Whoa. 
Welcome back to the Arnie Ball Show. The uh, probably the best part of the show is what takes place off the camera. <laughs> the, the final four. We talked a little bit about Stanford having a matchup with that. What do, what do we know about uh, Pepperdine going into that thing? Um, Blake, have you gotten any inside scoop mm -hmm. from those people out there? Are they all quiet? Just a little one. <laughs> um, there's a kid who plays for Pepperdine. His name is Alan Grinberg. He's from Tel Aviv, Israel. It's, he's a 6'2 outside hitter. And what's interesting about it is this kid started the year at Penn State. And he gave a verbal commitment to Penn State's coach. And then there were some problems with his transcript, so he wasn't eligible for the fall semester. And he, then he decided, well, I'm going to go to Pepperdine. So he went to Pepperdine, and, and the Penn State players are still upset with him. If he'd have gotten his transcripts at the time to Penn State, he'd have been at Penn State right now. And Pepperdine more than likely would not be here. But mm. the Penn State kids are really interested in playing this kid. <laughs> to say the least. Coach, what have you, uh, anything new that you've heard from? Uh, How can I top that? Uh, huh? <laughs> That's a pretty good This guy's like, a, like a, a snooper scooper or something <laughs> here, huh? <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, I, I've not seen him play. Of course, we, I know a little bit of something about them. I saw the stat sheet when they beat Long Beach uh, out there for the division championship. And uh, they had two players uh, total, 160 some sets. And I think they only had like 200 and some for the match. Storenson had 99, and this young man that Blake's talking about had 60 some. Uh, so it appears from the people that I've talked to that they are primarily, now Dwayne Cameron can add to that, I think he can bring some heat, but it appears that they're really a two man team. And uh, the young man from Turkey and of course Sorensen, they sit everywhere, including off the bench. Uh, <laughs> Chip McCaw is their setter, he's a freshman from Oklahoma. I understand he's a pretty nice player, I've not seen him play. Uh, but he's still a freshman setter, and uh, he's not, not extremely big. I think maybe 6'3", six, 6'4", six, maybe 6'2", uh, somewhere in that area. But that's what I do know about him is they have two kids that, that will stick the ball in particular. Um, in the finals with Pepperdine and uh, Penn State, where, where do you see that match going? Pepperdine going to be able to take them easily, or is Penn State going to provide them with some, uh, some problems? Well, let Blake answer that. He you know, has all the insight. <laughs> Pepperdine beat Penn State twice this year, three zip both times. Uh, I think Penn State scored more than 10 points in a game once out of the six games. This will be over in three, which will be good because then those guys will get out there quicker. Okay, so don't don't get there late. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, you got a question for Coach? Well, Coach, uh, everybody knows your reputation for the offensive wizard <laughs> and uh, your, your high-tech <laughs> offensive system. <laughs> and what I was wondering... Have you got anything special planned for the Final Four? Anything you've saved back here that no one else has seen? Jeez, Blake, I've used all my imagination this <laughs> year. There's nothing I could imagine be creative enough to come up with. Actually, we do have a little something. Uh, <laughs> that it. <laughs> it just kind of depends on whether or not who's refereeing. Uh, Patty Salvatore and Tom Pingle, both who have uh, refereed for us, are going to be one of the officials, and Wink Davenport is supposed to be the other one. I understand he's got a bad leg, and he may not be able to be here, but... A little bit depends on who's officiating. We have a couple of little things that, if indeed Pepperdine try, or excuse me, Stanford tries to do to us with her serving, we just might throw a little wrinkle into our serve reception pattern and see what happens. Why not tell us what it is? This will yeah. be on when you guys are playing. Oh well, uh, we've been working all year on letting uh, Loy receive the serve uh, with uh, as the setter, and us attacking the second ball with a quick attack. Uh, with our middle attackers. So rather than us passing, setting, and hitting, it would just be us <laughs> receiving the serve immediately. A short serve, is, and it's very easy to do. A short serve and letting then our middle attacker jump and hit the second ball. If that happens, everybody in the whole <laughs> building will just kind of go, oh, that's not the way this game's played. You're supposed to hit it three times, including the official, so we'll have to clue the official in ahead of time. We have to see if Stanford will cooperate. You know, if they don't cooperate, then we won't be able to do that little thing. Uh, we also have worked with Norman hitting the, out of the back row off that second ball, too. Oh, it's really easy to do. Loy can handle the ball just no problem with the short serve. Uh, we really don't have any other surprises other than that kind of thing. Uh, we, will, we will probably do some things defensively that we haven't done maybe all year for the most part. Uh, we'll, we'll probably do some commitment and some chasing. Have you ever seen that done before? Nope. Do you know if it's legal? Sure. Okay. You're right, it's legal. <laughs> yeah, it's legal. I have seen, uh, matter of fact, we've done, we've done this this year. Norman has received the serve with his hands. Yeah, yeah I've seen that. That's true. So what makes it illegal? 
Yeah. As long as Lloyd that, receives it and we hit it, who cares? That brought everybody up off the opposing now, bench, too. The, awesome. I, the ideal situation would be if I could really, really get Stanford to cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> and they would do it in the right rotation where our, where our opposite is in the front sure. row. Then we could run a double quick officer reception. And Jeez. who knows what would happen then. <laughs> Can you imagine the faces of everybody in the stadium? <laughs> or the guys on the other side of the net? I mean, they're sitting here thinking they have five more seconds to get set for defense, and here comes the ball. <laughs> and uh, two hitters up. <laughs> I'll tell you what I really... <laughs> the thing that would really be fun about it is if you could do it early in the match, because oh, then, then you know, the Stanford players and the Stanford coaching staff's got to go, what are we going to see next? What are these guys <laughs> going to do next? I mean, you, you know, indeed, that's, that they'd have to go through their mind a little bit. <laughs> Sad part about the whole thing, if we were able to do it, was it happened so fast that half the people in the stands wouldn't see it. Yeah, that's right. That would be the sad part about it. So it'd be a great instant replay for CBS television. <laughs> That's got to rank right up there with your all left-handed team we talked That's about right. one time. Well, I'm going to do that someday. I'm still convinced I have done that. I can. I'm convinced that that would be a great thing to do. You guys just got to have some imagination. It's not even fun if you don't have any imagination. Well, you're kind of playing with some minds on this one. That uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. If it were Pepperdine, first time out of the shoot, I mean, Dunphy might have a heart attack because uh, he just couldn't deal with that. Mr. One. Conservative. Yeah. Well, I'm in hopes that, because I haven't seen when everybody else practices, but I, our hope is that Stanford were to practice after us on Thursday or Friday because the teams always come in a little bit early, you know, and sit, and that never bothers us. And so I thought if they did, we'd practice that right in front of them and see how, see how they reacted to that and give them something to think about. <laughs> The games people play. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not allowed to carry a whip, so I'm just <laughs> one thing. <laughs> oh, let's let's get back into uh -huh. into your bailiwick just just a little bit. <laughs> Maybe we won't. I don't know. Um, Blake, what are some of the the changes you've seen media-wise in the sport in the last three, four, five years that you've been uh, been covering this? Locally or nationally? Yes. Okay. Nationally, um, there's been a new Volleyball magazine It's competing with Volleyball Monthly, and I think it has forced Volleyball Monthly to expand their coverage throughout the rest of the country, and, and I think that has helped. Um, other than that, I'm not sure there's been that much growth nationally. Locally, going to the Final Four last year in Hawaii was really picked up, I think. Uh, there's a lot more competition. Um, I've noticed this year I've had to work a little bit harder in some areas just because of the competition, which has been good. And it seems like there are more and more people interested in the program. The interest, obviously, that you have been able to generate within the media and the broadcast media also, Channel 6 and uh, the local broadcast media, is uh, uh, certainly translated into fans in the stands. What kind, let's talk fans in the stands just for a second, Coach. Uh, we're going to wrap this up really quick. Um, what kind of a crowd do you anticipate uh, we'll have down there at Ball State? I mean attitude-wise, not necessarily attendance-wise, but attitude-wise. Let me address attendance-wise first. I know that we're going to have my wife and my two daughters. <laughs> so I know there are going to be three people there, uh, whether or not they sell any more tickets or not. Uh, certainly, I would hope, and they claim they've gotten 5,000-plus tickets sold, that uh, I would hope that they would cheer for us. I mean, we're the only representative from this part of the country, and I'm Certainly, I'm hopes and they're not going down to cheer for Pepperdine or Stanford or Penn State, and I think that will be true. You know, we're going to have our pep band there. Uh, of course, our mascot, who does such wonderful things for us, will be there. I really believe that uh, the majority of the crowd will be uh, be on our side, and it could really play a fa be a factor in the outcome of the of the match. I was going to say that was going to be the next question: is the impact it would have. The building you've talked about down there before is, is a noisy building. Uh, we get 5,000, 6,000 screaming fans in there from the Midwest. Uh, I'm not sure that Stanford's ever had to deal. Blake, you've done the research on this thing. Does Stanford <laughs> have to deal with that kind of a crowd? Well, last year Stanford led the country in attendance, and they only averaged, I think it was eight or nine hundred a match. So they're not used to that. That'll be interesting to see how that uh, how that reacts. Obviously, our kids play off of the crowd. They they love the bigger the crowd, the better they like it. In fact, they play best in front of the big crowds. What makes you say that? Well, it just seems the way they the way they play over at Ohio State. Sometimes when they've got 20 people in the stands, they're kind of slow and sluggish. At home, they seem to be a little more alive. And Hell, Jim, I coach <laughs> I coach better in front of a big crowd. What are you talking about? Oh, that's it. Huh? 
<laughs> I think it's pretty, I mean, I, I have a real hard time getting motivated when there are only 50 or 100 people up there in a the crowd or just my wife and my two daughters, not that I don't love them. Uh, <laughs> but I'll tell you what, there's five, 6,000 people in there. I'll be the most entertaining person in the building, let alone the volleyball players. And our kids are the same way, certainly. The kids like playing in front of those big crowds and especially when they're on your side, they're not hooting and hollering at you. I think that it'll really be uh, an advantage for our, for our kids. Well, there certainly has been a great deal of interest around our office, and I'm certainly you've found it throughout town in this uh, this Final Four this year. Coach, I want to wish you the, and the team the best of luck, and uh, I, I think this would be kind of fun for us to get together after the Final Four, and we'll exchange some more ideas. Maybe if we can talk to Blake and doing this again, it'd be kind of fun. Only if Greg takes my place if we lose. Okay. If we win, I'll be here. <laughs> Otherwise, Greg, this is your chair. <laughs> Blake, I want to thank you for all your help. And uh, certainly uh, throughout the year, and, and thanks for being with us today. Coach, again, best of luck. Thanks.